You're listening to the RU Radio Network on Spreaker.com. Hello and welcome to the latest edition of the RU Radio Network. I'm here once again with all of my favorite folks from Resident Undead. And today we have a special guest host. We are, we're going to just jump right into this. This is awesome. We have recruited someone brand new for Resident Undead. Known by her various aliases, uh, Weebs a Palooza, Weeby, Weebs. I don't even know if I actually know your Christian name. But there are a lot of there's <laughs> it street names. It doesn't exist at this point. No, no, you have a lot of street names no. that we go by. And he goes, you know, I, I, I really, we want to bring you on on Resident Undead. And I said, yeah, for Saint Joseph. And he was like, no. Uh, I don't no, think you understand what I'm saying. Weebs. I don't think you understand what I'm saying. Like. Like a permanent fixture. Is this something that that you might consider? And I'm like, are you what? What's happening right now? I just got, uh, I'm proposing to you, Weeb. I just got the paranormal proposal of a lifetime. <laughs> he was down on one knee. I was with down on one knee with a fourth. Pandora in hand. <laughs> I want to give a super shout out to Greg and Kathy Fateik. Um, you guys were incredible to us. And you, you know you got us access in, and really just you know just treat us like family. And we really appreciate that. You're very good people, and couldn't have done this shoot without you. I was thinking about the operations because we were going to have these problems. Uncle Tony, for anyone who doesn't know, uh, Tony Santori, Uncle Tony, he is incredible, and I'm, I'm pretty sure he saved our lives that night. He d absolutely did. Yeah. yeah. We've made our way back to Northern Ohio to dive into a 200,000 plus square foot labyrinth. The remaining structure was built in 1916 and for the next 80 years it would serve as the area's primary care center. Containing an ICU and emergency room that was state of the art for its time, they were ready to take on any medical emergency. With a countless number of deaths and traumatic experiences, there's no doubt the energy still remains. Welcome to St. Joseph's Hospital. No. You're a creep and so is he. <laughs> As you were saying, the chaos, before you said that though, it's you can it's like a almost like a just a whirlwind of energy circling around me. Tell me what happened to you. If you if you can just even grasp it for a moment, what happened to you? Whatever I'm seeing over there, though, is not a child. It's much larger and more imposing. Oh, I really don't. I just would like to not be in here. I just feel drained. I gave up everything to walk down this road. Myth, danger, adrenaline. I've learned a lot along the way, and I've adapted my methods accordingly. For one, I wasn't sure how I felt about psychics, but I've tested them. I can say at least the ones I've worked with are legit. I never dreamed I would own a seminary, but I do. This entire journey has made me undeniably passionate about saving our past. My friends and I use unconventional methods to find the truth within every legend and to capture the voices of spirits. Oh, that's a human tone voice. You may have heard my name, it's Adam, and I invite you to travel with me as we find and call the Resident Undead. St. Joseph's Hospital. Constructed in 1916, this juggernaut would provide medical services to Lorain, Ohio and its surrounding areas. It would be armed with some of the most state-of-the-art equipment and be the last line of defense in the fight against life or death. Countless births and deaths would occur within these walls, and although those records were lost, the imprints left behind can easily still be felt. For the course of the next 80 years, this prestigious establishment served exactly what it was designed to do. And now sitting only as an abandoned relic, 
it's by far one of the most eerie reminders of our own mortality. Tonight's investigation will be by far the most challenging to date in the last eight years. We're dealing with a structure that takes up literally multiple city blocks and has no electricity. To counter this problem, we will be using a generator to power all of our equipment, and Uncle Tony will be posted as security due to the constant break-ins. On top of this, we will be joined by our newest member, Annie Weibel, and our very close friend, Michelle Bellinger. As many of you know, when we bring Michelle in, it's a dueling psychics kind of investigation, and tonight will be no different. Prior to every investigation we've done, I've always been confident that we're gonna map out the haunting. But with this hospital and 80 years of chaotic energy stained within its walls, I can't even begin to measure what we're up against. All right, it's rolling around nine o'clock and we are beginning our investigation inside the St. Joseph's Hospital. I'm gonna introduce the crew here for tonight. Annie Weeble. Hi. Good old Chris Musgrove. And he's like, what? Let's do it. Let's go. <laughs> Rebecca. Hi. And Michelle Bellinger. So what we're going to do, there's a lot of territory to cover. 200,000 square feet or so. It's got to be even more than it's that. It's huge. Huge, right? It's huge. So. We're gonna hit some key points. We just we've tried to map it out from earlier today. We'll see what will happen. So, let's uh, let's take a walk down this way. Let's roam a little. Let's. Uh, what we'll do here is let's hold an active EVP session real quick, right over here. All right. This is a device we use, a tool or toy, however you'd like to look at it. To all of you, this will help us speak to you. At least the three of us. Michelle and Becca can see you. So if you'd like to tell them anything afterwards as well, they will tell us. Here we go. One, two, three. Go ahead and say whatever's on your mind. And DVP, ending. All right, Chris, I'm gonna take it to yours here real quick. And then we'll get a, see what you guys also saw happening. Playing back. One, two, three. Go ahead and say whatever's on your mind. And DVP. Mm -hmm. Something there. Hang on, I can decode that. I heard a help right out the bat. Yeah, off the bat. And it was something, um... One, two, three. Go ahead and say whatever's on your mind. Oh! oh maybe, I don't know, I hear... Help get me to heaven? Help get help me back get to me heaven. Help get me back to heaven. Most of the vets that I picked up that seemed to be people who were still here, um, and one of them showed up toward the end at the ER, like he didn't belong in the ER, he'd been somewhere else, but, uh... We're staying because they were worried that they wouldn't have anywhere to go because of the things that they'd done. Like mm -hmm. some of them were, were carrying some guilt around. Words need those. Um, I don't. That might be a vet that I. I don't know if it's an actual ghost. I think it's just residual stuff. But there's the man wheeling down the hallway, and I can't make out the last word. All I all I hear is, "Give me my. I need my." But he's pointing to something that's not there. Like, it's like, he doesn't really know what he needs. He's like thinking of like, like, um, he's thinking he's somewhere else. Like he needs his, um, I can't make it out, but like something he needs in the immediate like zone, like battle zone. Like, I need that. Give me that. It's really sad. And a crying lady. I mean, not a crying lady, a crying baby in a lady's arms, but it's residual. I don't see it. Good. Describe that again. A, ba a woman. Okay. In the mm. corner, holding a baby, a crying baby, and, and rocking the baby. 
<laughs> so I'm going to leave something that is intentionally crafted and see if Becca picks up on it. And I will, I will describe what I'm going to try to leave here. Uh, let's make something real simple. A baby. Uh, a little baby all red in the face and crying. Just somebody holding their baby. Uh, no solid, just, just baby crying. And I'm going to picture that image and the sound, just baby squalling. Uh, probably a newborn, like really red, still pink. Crying. <laughs> That's amazing. That's good. Yeah, that That's is good. I mean, it is. Um, I'm having trouble with the ICU because my brain is naturally blocking things out. So I'm going to just go ahead and say that. I'm not having a lot of luck. I don't feel well. So if I pass out, you're gonna oh, oh, you're, you're, you're gonna f hate me for this. I'm gonna die. <laughs> That's how I die. Suicide somewhere. I don't feel good. I can't. I don't. I don't want to go in there either. Um. I'm waking out. <laughs> what? That's okay. We'll give you, we can. Yeah, I don't think we, I can't. I don't think I, I, I'm not, I can't. Take, take a moment. It's been a while since I've seen Becca tripped up over the energy around us. And the last time was the House of Wills and I learned my lesson from it. What we would do next is take her back down to base and set up for Chris's quarantine. A quarantine is the part of the night where each of us will be isolated in the location's most highly active areas. The concept is simple. Since we believe some spirits are intimidated by our numbers, this will give them the opportunity to feel less threatened. We'll leave Chris up here where all of ICU will be at his disposal, and we'll be two floors below where we've set up a base with a TV that has a live feed directly to him. Becca will be watching his every move with us at base, and Michelle will be isolated several rooms down where she will remote view what is happening around him. So with 20 minutes on the clock and two Pandoras running, Chris's quarantine begins now. As you were saying, the chaos before you said that, though, it's you can it's like a almost like a just a whirlwind of energy circling around me. We are synced. Yes, we're synced. All right, I'm gonna check the line on the way down. All right, brother. Hey, here we go. Here we go again. again. It's all yours. Let's do it. Have fun with it. Oh, I will. Okay, like the 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 challenge here is to just bore through the floors and just all the layers of stuff here and just focus on him. I see you, baby. I see you too, baby. You know. I think Chris is scared. More, well, more afraid of the living than not. I think you're a little bit of a puss. <laughs> all right. <laughs> 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 <That's really laughs> Keep that quiet. We'll, we will erase that from the footage, but... <laughs> Live. On Pandora's. This is a really fun challenge, because I do long distance work frequently, but not usually at ground zero of such a really intensely layered place that there's so many distractions. While up here, you can hear so much residual energy. Obviously, I'm in the ICU, and they said you could hear just all kinds of hustle and bustle. And I'm already hearing footsteps just a couple minutes in. I'm not sure I want to go in them. I will eventually. Oh, this is just chaos. I'm going to try to describe what this is like inside my head. And it's... You know those old flip books that you used to make with like, imagine one, but with like different pictures, completely different scenes. A guy, a woman, like old, like old, young, broken, heart attack, cancer, their guts are falling out, like just. 
awful. One old guy just laying there in a breathing tube. Can you tell me what you're in ICU for? What happened to you? Can you tell me what you're in ICU for? What happened to you? Keep your stuff in the area. Keep your stuff in the area. I think he's already got the attention of the guy that I saw in ICU. I don't think that guy, like, belongs expressly to ICU, ICU but there was the first place that I saw him anyway. You have so many layers stacked down on this. You know, when you deal with hospitals, this is the worst. This is ground zero of just emotion after emotion after emotion stacked in layers. This one would, I don't even know if we need, this one would be a little too intense. Somebody lost a kid. I don't know of, of what, I don't. When the, our friend Michelle was up here, she walked into two rooms. Can you tell me? One of the numbers of the room she walked in. One of the numbers of the room she walked in. It'd be easier to make him hear than it will be to make him see, but I want to get to seeing as well, but let's start with hearing. Can one of you patients do me a favor and either knock on the one of the windows in your room or make a loud noise in what room you're in, please? Yep, that's right, Chris. You have to do a little louder than that, though. What did you see in that back room there? Was there uh, something? I think that. Um, wow, words hand on glass. It is heavy as shit up here. Chris is, I've never seen Chris intrigued like this. I think the last time I saw him this excited was in the basement of St. Albans. Do it again. It's, it's kind of hard to see, but I'm, for those of you watching, I'm literally standing in the middle of ICU, and it's, as you were saying, the chaos. Before you said that, though, it's you can, it's like a, almost like a, just a whirlwind of energy circling around me. Man, I know enough about a hospital to guess that this is ICU and this is where you would close people into rooms. Especially if you were worried about contagion, especially if you had them on all the hardcore machines, oxygen, whatever. And I just had the sense of someone over there just standing and looking at me. Male, I think, again. If there's anybody who wants to talk, sure. Not down here, go up there. Do I need to put signage? Are you trying to get my attention? Because you've got it. F my ears just are ringing, like with the high pitched whistle type. My ears are starting to buzz. My ears are starting to buzz. No. You're a creep and says he. <laughs> it sucks because it felt, <clears throat> it's almost like there's an energy pulling me to this far side and I can't go that way. To this far side and I can't go that way. 
can't go that way. There's a boy crying for his mother. It's like he's six again, but he's closer to 16. He knows he's dying. Died. Has died. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, um, a little kid talking about his nose, something about the daddy's nose. I can't tell the gender of the kid, but basically, <laughs> Chris has a funny nose. <laughs> He's on cloud nine right now. I'm not gonna take him down. I'm not gonna take him down. Was you a veteran? I'm a veteran. I was in the Marine Corps. Can you tell me what branch of service you were in? It's not just adrenaline, it's like intrigue, it's like an emotional connection, it's like this weird... Alright Adam, it's 20 minutes. Good for you, Chris. Take one more minute and just ride it home. <laughs> Some kid thinks your nose is <laughs> to do. Get it going, Chris. There you go. <laughs> little boy, <laughs> yes, sir. I think it's fine, but this kid's talking shit. They usually do. Children always, yeah. I just looked down and I looked up. And chilled to the bone. I swear to God, when I looked up, I seen a shadow. It's, you can't see into this room. Pass in front of this window going outside, and we're two floors up. Creepy as shit, whatever it was. Okay, good. Because I'm tired of turning in circles. I feel like I gotta watch my back. Making our way to two. Uh, missing a few teeth, doesn't have a lot of control of his tongue. Asking for a, a water or a bourbon. <laughs> the night that you asked me to come here with you guys, I had a vivid dream of being just sitting in a hospital hallway, just sitting down like cross-legged in the floor, and there's a room, rooms all down the hall, just like this. I look to the right, and from this room comes this little girl. She's probably two or three years old, short, dark, curly hair. I just heard something back there. Um, short, dark, curly hair, huge brown, almost black eyes, and these big rosy cheeks, rosy lips, She's wearing a hospital gown, and she's dragging a teddy bear behind her in her left hand. And when she comes out to the hall, she reaches for me. And so I reach back, and she starts to climb in my lap. And when she does, I woke up. Um, so last night, I had a second dream, and it was the four of us in a room together talking about coming here. And I start saying the name Sally. And then I start calling her Sally Girl. And it's almost like in a, a sing-song voice, like Sally Girl. And I look at Chris, and Chris goes, she knows that we're coming. And that was it. But I knew after the first dream that whatever I was looking for was going to be on the second floor of this hospital. Yeah. And it might seem weird to people who like see kids in hospitals about a kid like playing around in hospitals, but as a kid who grew up in hospitals, like you get bored and like have wheelchair races, right? All sorts of crazy stuff. Like if you can pull your IV out and just go pelting down the, the mm -hmm. hall, you do. Yeah. I, I, I was a regular escapee. You know what, Annie? We're gonna put you up here. All I right. Know you would. Mm -hmm. I want to. Perfect. No fit. doubt.
For the last year, I followed Annie online before asking her to be a part of Resident Undead. I admired her dedication, courage, and strong approach. There are many things I'm still learning about her, including a sensitivity she expressed when we started to walk through the hospital. In my conversations with Michelle, I've heard about the varying degrees of psychic intuition, including the innate intuition we may all have within us. I believe in objectively testing and learning about intuition, just like we test our ability to communicate with spirits through our devices. It will be interesting to learn more about Annie as she continues to learn more about herself. Until then, 20 minutes are on the clock, and her quarantine begins now. I got a lot of chills, a lot of energy. It just shifted. We are lined up. Awesome. curious to see how it resonates as Annie does her thing because everybody closes up differently and, and kind of arranges their shields differently and then opens up differently to perceive stuff. So. Well, hold on, I just lost the... Oh no! Did, we just, did you kick something? Nothing. I'm she just said her camera down. went dead. Oh, camera went dead? Everything's dying. Totally dead. Oh, wait, you're back. You're back. You're back. Okay. Also, she's not going to know the fault between the same doors. I, I told her about okay. that. Okay. Seeing a little bit of shadow play out of one of the rooms up here, but it's so dark in this hallway that you can't, it, it's hard to detect. The only little bit of light that I have is coming in through a couple of open windows. <laughs> It makes sense that there would have been. Um, Annie's really good children. at protecting herself, so she's All got her guard up. Do you want me to help you? I'm a nurse. Do you want me to help you? I'm a nurse. You're so damn good at protecting yourself, you're filling the space up with protection and it's making it hard to talk to the dead around you. <laughs> it's like, what? <laughs> now, notably, I was also curious to see how, how big a difference this was make, would make, because I did not do a sync up with her. I just kind of wanted to see if I could ping her from a distance. And uh, notably, what I'm getting is some, some shielding. That's a red button. Did it die? It's dead. <laughs> no stack. Hello, there is a little kid right there. Oh, <laughs> oh no way. <laughs> Damn. Hey. We'll see if we bring it back, awesome, but that's great. Uh, that was awesome. on, you had a, a child trying to talk to you. Yeah, I'm not sure if that's something to do with it. Yeah. Okay. Who keeps turning my camera off? Who keeps turning my camera off? What did the child want to say? It was just in the corner, and when I pointed at it, everything disappeared, so I lost the connection to the kid. Mm. Uh, the kid doesn't feel very good. Mm. The kid's mad that the kid doesn't feel good. Kids do this thing where they, they swell up and they look really scary. You have attracted the attention of a child who does not feel good and is angry about not feeling good? 
it could be the culprit to shutting the camera down. I'm not really sure why I would do that. So maybe direct at that as a lead. Well, actually, Annie, you could ask Annie how she's feeling because she's mm -hmm. sensitive. I don't know. It, it's it's an odd. I expected to feel more, but I almost feel like they're hiding. But it almost looks like I keep seeing a shadow figure in the main doorway that's coming up through here. Talk to that. Becca wants you to reach towards that. Put your focus on that. You're onto something. Whatever I'm seeing over there, though, is not a child. It's much larger and more imposing. What I'm visualizing is standing behind Annie, slightly above, but behind. Trying to direct from that perspective across her shoulder. Here's me or feels me, it'll be back here. I got a lot of chills, a lot of energy. It just shifted. What I'm seeing is, I can't really even show it to you. You can't see, it's too dark, but it's over my shoulder right there in that main doorway. The one troubling thing about hospitals, you have so many layers. Um, it's a universe to itself of who, who is talking and what layer. My ears are starting to pop, like pressure change. That's good. Now there's something swirling around her. It's anger, which is probably from, I don't, I'm not going to speculate, anger. Mm -hmm. I am here to communicate only. Just felt something rush up behind me. Cold air. I think she can feel me from here. I don't know that she's recognizing it as me. But I'm pretty sure we're not communicating clearly. I don't mean anyone any harm. Ooh, I just got really dizzy. Annie wants to talk to this kid, and there's all this stuff that keeps interrupting. There's something not in this room, I think deeper in the space that just, like I just felt like a full body, like buzz and a pull in that direction. But why do they have to do it today? Why, why do they have to do that? I don't want, there's, there's a lot of, a lot of bargaining. Um, so many different people. Can you tell me how you died? Can you tell me how you died? I don't think he understands where he is. And when I say he doesn't understand where he is, he doesn't understand the fact of He's not on this plane of existence anymore, and it's confusion because of whatever the trauma that happened to him. Oh, I'm still got this splitting headache right here. Your okay. All right, so we've been roaming for about a half hour now. Um, but I think we went like five city blocks that way. We came up the stairs. I remember seeing something earlier. I think we're on the right floor. Maybe it's one above us. It was, here it is, over here. Yep, this is it. We saw these earlier today when we were doing the B-roll. Still creepy, even, yeah, doesn't go away on this, even night to day. Surgical. <laughs> These things still move. Yeah. Yeah. 
I, uh, uh, saving this is a, what's a, you all right? No, yeah. Yeah. I just kind of know what you're thinking, but go yep, ahead. You know what I'm thinking. So, we talked about this a little bit earlier today. Um, I think it's, it's a hospital. What else do we know better? You know, some nurse, doctor, patient. Let's, uh, let's throw it in the mix. Let's get Michelle. Michelle's back down at base right now. We'll get her back up here. Let's throw a ripple together in surgical, all right? Let's do it. A ripple in time is a favorite resident undead strategy used in order to stimulate the dead for maximum interaction. We believe that if you introduce something from their past, they're much more likely to respond to you. With Michelle joining us again, we most definitely need to throw her in the sidelines with Becca to take note of everything that is interacting with us. Each of them will keep their notes separate until the end. And in the meantime, Annie and myself will pretend to save Chris's life. I believe that over the last five years of doing this, it's been Chris's undeniably talented impromptu acting that has driven it home for us each time. And we'll make sure this is no different. I got his feet, CPR! So what's gonna happen real quick, so I was like, yeah. uh, I'm just gonna freak out. And I'm like, I don't even know what to do. I need some help, I need some help. Nurse, nurse! And then wait 30 seconds. Kind of like any time we do an action, just kind of give them enough time to talk and then come in and just own this shit. We'll just improvise. All right. And recording on Pandora, recording on Pandora. Check him over here. He's got something wrong with him right there. I need you to start an IV. Okay, I'll you grab it. Disabling, okay? His mother's trying to get in, ma'am. You have to stay out there. You have to stay out there. You okay, have to stay out there. We uh, don't have a pulse. He's got a uh, cardiac arrest. I'm going to try CPR. CPR, all right. Go. I got his feet. CPR. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Michelle, what did you see? 
Uh, well, I started with the uh, caveat that I might be a little distracted because a lot of the younger, mostly nonverbal people from the ER had kind of followed me up. Mm -hmm. um, weren't really keen on letting go. Once we started that, though, they scattered. Um, the first pause, nothing. Um, uh, the second pause, murmuring, indistinct, couldn't make it out. Uh, the third, there was uh, a kid that was like, not just like, I want my mommy, but it was like, I want my mommy! Like, it was just... Um, fourth, uh, after she was gonna intubate him, um, there was a sense, at first it was nothing, and then there was a sense of like a medical person, not uh, somebody who'd suffered something, but uh, one of the, either one of the workers or an echo of one of the workers just kinda observing, but again, not, not saying much. Uh, fifth, during the lead up, this wasn't during the pause, you guys were still talking, but uh, there was, uh, like a little sense of disapproval. It might have been the caretaker, but I wasn't sure because he's not been very talky. And this kind of had the, the, the sense of like, this isn't play acting, like kind of the sense of like, you, you haven't seen bad. Becca? Okay, so. Um, I did get a vague, I think whenever you guys do that, all the screaming and stuff, I think it scatters energy. Mm -hmm. It makes mm -hmm. it so that I start to see echoes differently. When a lot of the int intelligent ones were just like, whoa, okay, I'm, I'm out of here. <laughs> right, so I think a lot of what I picked up on was more echoes and like stuff that happened in the room. I don't think that there is a demon here. I think there is somebody who experienced their final moments here and they weren't, in the South they say if they weren't right with Jesus, they just didn't feel like they were in a place in their lives where they were ready to die. So I got a lot of, um, I think I'm going to hell, I'm seeing all these terrible things. So a vague gunshot, I don't know what it's associated with. Um, a, a, a man saying, I'm not ready to die, man, I don't want to die, I'm not ready to die, this can't be real, you know, like that sort of de denial. Um, a, male, a male presence, observing, pacing, a little worried, yeah. Caretaker. I yeah, something like that. No better word for the dude. Yeah. Immediately after this, we'd head down to the ER where Michelle and Becca would give some quick reads. As expected, they both picked up on the trauma that was stained into the walls. So what I decided to do after their reads was to do something a little different and have Michelle join me in my quarantine here. For the next 20 minutes, she'll be my eyes on the ground while the team watches back at base. Rolling on Pandora's. Rolling on Pandora. Michelle's saying something in her head. Can't hear it. I just know she's talking. I want to call to all of you who came here on the worst day of your life. The sudden, the unexpected, the accidental. You came through here. Young or old. Young or old. I see a, a, a man, man behind Michelle, angry. What's it? Uh, for some of you, I understand that this may have been a final destination. I know a lot of things happened here. You've seen Michelle through the entire night. She's going to help me communicate with you. She's going to help me communicate with you. I don't know your name. Reach out. I will take your hand. Will speak for you if you let me. <laughs> it's, all, it's, not, it's not funny. It's the joy that just came off of him, the excitement that made me laugh. I just got a chest pain and my heart started then like this abnormal rhythm. All right. Mm hmm. Got somebody she's connecting with, though. I get the sense of like a vehicular accident. 
um, or, or some sort of moving vehicle accident. Like there, it looks like impact. I can't see uh, from like here. I just see mostly his face. Um, and he can't talk as well as he, 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 he would like. Like there's at the side of his mouth, I think is there, there's something. I don't know that he's got anything broken. It's just uh, there's enough blood that he's a little mush mouthed. I understand this may be very hard. Focus, focus on, on my voice right now and do the best you can. Tell me what happened to you. If you, if you can just even grasp it for a moment, what happened to you? What happened to you? Passing ambulance, possibly. Probably cop car. Cop car. Cop car. <laughs> <laughs> that was great. Setting straight. It goes cop car. Okay. <laughs>All night, Michelle kept picking up on a male presence who was very protective of the building. She felt him during our morning walkthrough and during the ripple. And with her about to bring it up a third time, I felt it was necessary to tell her she was on the right trail. Ultimately, this may be the best window of opportunity to communicate with the direct soul of this building. It has a very male feel, and he hasn't been very talkative. He's just stoic watches. If I poke too hard, retreats. And it's always that way over that way. I didn't tell Michelle this earlier. I was informed of someone like this, that you are protective of the hospital. Let's try to clear some things up. He's concerned that the people are in here um, may do something to some of the spirits that would, wouldn't be kind. So he does follow us around and he protects the hospital. These devices will allow you to speak. Michelle can hear you as well. Tell me, why are you protective over this building? Why are you protective over this building? Is that bad? Is that bad? Sir, it makes... It makes sense to me, you put blood, sweat, and everything to keeping this building operational. If you were anyone, a caretaker, maintenance. No, caretaker is the word that he wants to give. Caretaker. You've done an incredible job, and I don't want you to think that because of its current state is your fault. Things crumble, but I will tell you, you've got good people here taking care of it now with you. Things crumble, but I will tell you, you've got good people here taking care of it now with you. Sir, I, I understand the labor of trying to save a building, and I, I really respect that even in death, you would still stay here, almost on patrol. I really respect that. We're not here, like Michelle said, we're not here to prove that you exist. We know that. We would just like to tell your story a little farther to more people. You have more in common with Adam than you might think on, on first blush. He cares deeply about places as well. He puts blood and sweat and tears into them. He inspires people to care for them. So if you ever wanted a, a sympathetic ear, you, you have it in him here. Well, because he usually has something funny to say, but what's he going to say right. right now, you know? And he has such a heart for people to, to hear about so many terrible things happening. In Adam's world, terrible things don't happen, really. I mean, obviously they do, but he doesn't linger on them. I was listening to you, and I thought I heard sound like a breath or a moan or like a, um, a sigh. I'm not sure if we would have caught it on audio. It caught my attention while you were talking. It was coming from that room over there. I, I, there's something. There's something. I think that, that, that bend you get like. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It, I felt like a shift. I'm not one for that right as you were. Yeah, it, it, it's, it, it was a pressure shift. Yes, a shift. Well, come on then.
It's okay. If you all want to walk in here, I'm, I'm, I'm game. I'm, I'm game. It's, it's cool. Come on. I'm not sure if it was dust, but something shot up between us. I, I would say we definitely got attention. I, I would say we definitely got attention. I just feel drained. After 20 hours inside the St. Joseph's Hospital, our investigation is complete. Since I started this adventure back in 2010, I've never encountered a location with so many obstacles to overcome on top of an extreme haunting. The dueling psychics experiment yielded interesting results as always, and I am beyond impressed with how Michelle and Becca peeled back so many layers in order to get to the core of the haunting. As we move forward, Annie will stay with us, and I'm excited to see where her path leads. The future is bright, and we're just getting started. Stay with us.